Praise the Lord and greetings. Welcome to the New Bethlehem Church. I'm Elder Litney Gray, uh, Christian Education Coordinator here, and I am so grateful to God for the blessings he has bestowed upon us as a church, as a body of Christ, and for all who are watching tonight or whenever you may go back and listen to this recording, I pray that you are blessed in your so as we continue to go through the do the best you can with your own life series and focusing on your purpose tonight we are in for a special treat i am not the speaker but we have a a dynamic guest speaker uh pastor relifer he taught last week and he has passed the baton on uh to a woman of god an evangelist a pastor uh just a a beautiful vessel for the kingdom of God. And we are honored that she would say yes to present on tonight. And so uh, Pastor Tanya Brown of Bethesda Temple Church of Alton, Illinois, uh, is going to present tonight. She's also the founder of Word for the World International Ministry. She's traveled. Um, she's ministered to both young and old uh, revivals, conventions, conferences, camps. Um, God has used her mightily. And I believe um, with that spirit of evangelism, with that spirit of being driven for the cause of Christ, um, I just am grateful to God that uh, Pastor Relifer and our Christian education team um, we all I like to collaborate and think, who can we bring in? But even uh, just extending that offer and her yes to uh, present on tonight is such a blessing. As we delve into the topic and purpose of uh, you were made for a mission, um, as we have talked about gone through it with the guide of the book the purpose driven life now don't worry if you don't have the book if you have your bible uh, if you have a journal a tablet i encourage you to go grab it um because i know the word is going to be rich and also there'll be a download of wisdom of knowledge um that we will be able to glean from and i pray that it will bless each and everyone listening so take a moment and share this link uh share it with somebody call them uh we, we still have a couple a couple uh minutes to uh for you to do so um i do want to share a couple prayer requests uh, before we continue um and that is for our own pastor bishop a glenn brady in his recovery process we do thank god he is um recovering um we do thank god for him and first lady brady and their entire family one continue to keep them in prayer uh through this time we're praying for lady yolanda mckinney pastor carl mckinney and their family in the transition of lady yolanda mckinney's dad um brother sydney watson that service will be held later this month and there's more details to come so we want to continue to pray and uphold that family in prayer as well as Brother Curtis Foster, one of our members who lost his nephew. Uh, we want to pray for him and the passing of his nephew, Martez Ellingberg. We uh, give our love and our condolences to those families um, going through grief and mourning. We know God uh, is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, and we're trusting him to continue to carry each family through. So um, I will pray and then the next speaking voice you will hear is that of pastor tanya brown thank god for her um so let us look to god in prayer father in the name of jesus thank you for today thank you father for giving us this space this moment this time to hear god your word thank you for unlocking the purposes you've placed inside of us for such a time as this. Lord, we come with our hearts open to you. We come with our ears and our minds willing and ready to learn that what you want to deposit. Bless, oh God, our pastor and first lady. 
their family. Bless our staff, pastors, and their families, all those grieving. Lord, we ask you to comfort all those who are sick, those on our prayer list. We ask that you would touch and heal in a mighty way. We believe you for miracles, signs, and wonders. Lord, we thank you, Father, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And we ask for your blessings and your divine intervention, oh Lord Jesus, to come through for each and every one. Lord, bless the word, bless the speaker, God, even as she has poured out, oh Lord Jesus, that which you have given her. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen and amen. God bless you. Um, I present Pastor Tanya Brown. Well, praise the Lord and greetings uh, to this great church. I'm just so grateful and so honored to be a part of this Life Impact series that you're doing. And I'm so happy for Pastor LaShawn Relaford, who invited me. We go way back for many years, all the way back to the Arkansas days uh, when he sang with the uh, Remnant Kingdom Priesthood and when I would come to Arkansas to minister. So I want to thank you so much for thinking of me and having me as a part of this impact service by permission of your awesome and great dynamic pastor, senior pastor, uh, the Honorable A. Glenn Brady. And I was just so honored to know that I was going to be able to participate in this great uh impact that you all are having on everybody through this impact series. Pastor Glenn Brady, uh, he doesn't know me, I'm sure, but I have been long an admirer of his, someone who has watched him from a distance uh, when he worked uh, very untiringly for the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World and for also for the Honorable Bishop Norman Wagner. I want to honor you, Pastor Brady. I've sat in some of your seminars that you've done for the P PAW many years ago, and I'm just grateful for the ministry that God has given you. I'm so thankful that the Lord has blessed you and all that he's doing for you in uh, at this church, New Bethel in Kansas City, Kansas. May God bless you and your lovely wife. We appreciate Lady Angela Brady as well. Uh, just another dynamic woman of God and all that she represents in the kingdom. She's not only smart, intelligent, educated, anointed, but she's gorgeous. And we thank God for uh, knowing you all. And I'm just happy to have this opportunity to speak for you during this series and hopefully have an opportunity to get to know you both better. So may the Lord bless you. And I thank you for allowing me and affording me this opportunity to talk to your congregation and to those who are listening today. I received um, the sketch or skeleton from your administrators. I mean, when, Bishop Brady, your name has always been synonymous with excellence, uh, with Pentecostalism, with apostolicism, and your people represent you extremely well. The professionalism from the first uh, reaching out to me to ask me to be a part of this, to the letters, to the follow-up, to the emails, to the correspondence on every level has been par excellent. And it is just a testament and a testimony of your leadership, uh, Bishop Brady. And I want to thank you so much for the way that your people so expertly and excellently handled uh, this whole maneuver. And I wanted to make sure that I said that so you will know how well as you already know, but it's just good to hear how well you're being represented. And so this is such an opportunity for me to talk about what they wanted me to talk about today. They were very careful to recommend that I did not go back and actually teach the book or the chapters that they had given me for this life impact, but to really put it and make it my own. And I was so happy to be able to do that because I think what you're talking about is so beneficial and it really has to do with our mission. It has to do with the mission um, that you have in serving God with this particular mission, serving God and the mission. And I think that it is absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal what you are uh, talking about here and how it has been a blessing. It's called You Were Made for a Mission. So let me, first of all, 
give you these scriptures and talk about the importance of the mission. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we know that scripture is very familiar to us uh, as Pentecostals, as apostolics. It says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then in Matthew 28, uh, 19, I'd like to begin at the 18th verse, because I think that is so crucial to understanding what the 19th verse is all about. And verse 18 says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then verse 19 says, go ye therefore. Therefore what? Why? Because all power is given unto him, a name, a person in heaven and in earth. So he says, go ye therefore and teach, instruct all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. These two passages of scripture go hand in hand together because they are showing us the mission of the church. So I want you to keep those two scriptures in mind while I, def while I define the word mission. Mission is an important task or duty that is assigned. It's a specific task that is assigned to a person or to a group of people. And so when we talk about mission, it really is defining your job, your operation, your duty, your responsibility, your requirement, your business, your business. In short, it is your purpose. Your reason for being is communicated through your mission. The word mission comes from the Latin words meaning to send, to send. And Jesus said that our mission after we receive the Holy Ghost is to be his witness. That's what we're talking about in Acts 1 and 8. That's the reason why we have this power to go and be sent to have and fulfill the purpose for which we have been called. And so what is a witness? A witness is a person who has seen or who can give firsthand evidence of some event, a person or thing giving or serving as evidence. When you think about yourself being a witness, you are a person who has experience something, you have seen something, you have heard something, you yourself are living evidence of whatever testimony needs to be made. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, to all of us, that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. So in both of these scriptures, Jesus has commissioned us to go. He has commissioned us to do something, to be a witness, to live it, to embody it, to personify this power that he has given us, to live it, to go teach people, to not only teach them, but then to baptize them. That right there is telling us the importance of baptism and to disciple them. And that's what he means by teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I am here to disciple others. And that is something that the church has to get a hold of. I think we have done a marvelous and tremendous job of preaching the gospel, telling people to repent, to be baptized, to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and even helping people to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some churches are very expert in being able to do that. But we have to go the step further because all of our churches have uh, experienced situations where we've gotten people baptized, we've gotten them filled with the Holy Ghost, but getting them 
to become stabilized, to become a disciple is extremely valuable and extremely crucial. And Jesus is saying to us that we must make disciples. We got to spread this gospel for the purpose of getting people saved. We got to share this message for the purpose of people coming to Christ. But what are they going to do after that? They have to be discipled. They have to learn how to observe the things that Jesus has spoken to them. That is one of the key components and the crucial points of the New Testament church. If we look in the book of Acts chapter 2, particularly verse uh, 42, I want to read that in your hearing, because I think that it is very, very crucial and very, very beneficial for you to understand what the New Testament church was about and is about. And after people got saved in verse number 41, it says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I want you to take particular note of that because they did something after they came to Christ, after they were added to the church. The Bible says in verse 42, and they continued. Now that is so powerful, and you have to realize how powerful that is. To continue means to abide. It means to stay. It means to remain. It means to uh, be established. They continued steadfastly without a break in continuity. They didn't make excuses. Nobody had to twist their arm. Nobody had to put a knife to their throat or a gun to their head and say, listen, you better come to church. You got to get here because if you don't get here, this is going to happen. Nobody had to coerce them. Nobody had to continue to call them up uh, text them, email them. Okay. We know they didn't have that back then, but they didn't have to keep on trying to follow up with the people. The Bible says that they continued the people who came to Christ. They continued daily. Look at this in verse number 42, steadfastly, steadfastly without a break in continuity. They continued steadfastly in what? In the apostles' doctrine. They, what does that mean? It means they came to be taught the word of God from the preacher's mouth, from the mouth of the apostles. I want to interject here. It is so important in this day and age that you have a pastor. That is vitally important. We have Facebook preachers and prophets. We have internet prophets. We have pew prophets and parking lot prophets. And there's so much false doctrine that we are being confronted with in this 21st century that if you don't have a pastor, you're going to be moved about with every wind of doctrine. It's people over here preaching this, people on YouTube preaching that. And that's the reason why God gave you shepherds. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, and he gave some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And if there's any time in the history of the church that you need pastoral leadership, that you need someone to shepherd your soul, the time is now because there's many false doctrines and prophets and spirits that have gone out into the world. And it is from the mouth of the leader that God has set over you that you're going to be able to stay established, to not be carried off with every wind of doctrine. That is so vitally important. It's becoming more and more important as we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, because everybody's got a word for you. Everybody's got some kind of uh, revelation or some kind of prophecy. And that's the reason why even in the New Testament, it tells you that when someone prophesies to you that let the prophecy be judged, who's supposed to judge it? Your pastor. Take that to your pastor and say to your pastor, Pastor Bishop, this is what I have received. This is what somebody said to me. How does this line up with the word? How does this set with your spirit? Because one thing is certain, if it is of God, 
it shall stand. If it's not of God, and many of these things that people are putting out there today on the internet, on, on social media, they are not of God. These are some people who are not even sitting under leadership themselves. And so they are trying to instruct you when they're not even being instructed. Take that prophecy to your pastor. Let it be judged however he decides to judge this prophecy, and God will bless you for it, and you will not make shipwreck like so many others have. I'm saying that to say because this topic that I'm speaking on today has to do with uh, sharing the good news, what the mission is. But if we have people who are particularly in leadership, a ministry, members of the church, members of the team, but they are not solid. If you're not established, if you're moving about with every wind of doctrine, if you're easily removed from your position, if you're not following the leadership that God has placed you under, uh, the godly leadership, the holy leadership that God, the proven leadership, the established leadership that God has placed you under, then it's difficult for you to help somebody else. And as you go about spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will not have the right spirit yourself. Everybody has to be connected to somebody. Everybody has to be a part of the fellowship. Everybody has to be under somebody. Every pastor needs a pastor. That is one awesome thing about your pastor, uh, Pastor uh, A. Glenn Brady. He sat under Bishop Norman Wagner for over 30 years. He's been a part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, a man of God who recognizes and values the offices and the leadership and the the, uh, the the authority that God has put him under. The man of God in the Bible said, he says, I'm under authority. And so I can be in authority. If we're not under authority, it's difficult for us to go about and even take the gospel because now people want to know who are you connected with? Who do you come from under? One of the reasons, strong reasons that I took this assignment in the midst of this busy, busy season that I'm in is because I heard the name Bishop A. Glenn Brady. And I know that he is solid. I know of him. I know of the service that he has provided for the Pentecostal assemblies of the world. And so that gave me a yes in my spirit where I didn't even have to think about it for a very long time. And I'm saying that to you today as you listen because it is so very important. You may not think what I'm saying right now is connected to spreading the gospel, but it very much is connected to spreading the gospel because nowadays we're raising people up in ministry who are uh, excited about their gifts, excited about their talents, excited about the ministries that God has given them. And we have become a people who are impressed and enamored with gifts and callings, but not character. Character is paramount. We have to have character. As we spread the gospel, people want to know, can I trust you? Can I depend upon you? Who are you? Who are you connected with? And I will say this, that in every other arena in life, whether it's a university, whether it's a job, whether it's a secular organization, you don't just go and join an organization, get a leadership position, a title and an office credentials because you just came out of nowhere. You're some Johnny come lately. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that in the school system, even in the grade school system. You have to have some records that follow you. If you go to college, they want to have your transcript if you transfer colleges. If you go to a job, even if it's a lateral move, they want to know who are you, where do you come from, what are your creden credentials, let me see your resume, because I need to know who you are before I place you in a position of responsibility. It's only in the church that we want to come in off the street, so to speak, and to demand that I be put in a position of honor, demand that I be put on payroll or in a position of authority. I want to teach. I want to preach. But who are you? Are you able to sit down and join the team, to be a part of the team so that we can know those who labor among us? I know that they knew you where you came from, but I want to know, Do can we learn anything about your character while you're here. Why? Because our mission 
for the church is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can't be watching our backs if we are out to serve our mission. And if everybody is on the same page, then we can do the work of God more effectively. When the Apostle Paul commended all of those um, women and men, and it was more women than men being commended in Romans chapter 16, but even when he commended Aquila and Priscilla, he talked about those people in the 16th chapter of the book of Romans. He said, these, they gave their lives for the gospel. They risked their lives for me. These are they that labored with me. They didn't just come in trying to be a big shot. They didn't just come in trying to get a title. They didn't just come in trying to exercise their gifts and their calling without character, but we were able to prove their character. They stayed with us. They allowed themselves to be developed. We have a mission as the church of God to not only preach the death, burial, resurrection, and teach people to observe all that Jesus commanded them to observe. But we have a, we, this is a part of making disciples. This is a part of spreading the good news. I want to say to you, church, do not be afraid to correct people, to put people in their place, to say, this is who we are. This is what we believe. This is, um, this is what we believe here. This is what our bishop teaches. This is how we conduct business over here. OK, because we have a mission to serve. We are on a mission to make disciples and we're not trying to make disciples be uh, twofold more the child of hell than those who are rebellious, those who are resistant, those who uh, uh, can't sit down under leadership. No, no, no. That's not what we're trying to raise up over here. We're trying to reach the people to spread the gospel. And when they come in, there's order. When they, when they come in, there's organization. When they come in, there's structure. When they come in, there's excellence. When they come in, there's respect for the leader of the house. And so as we talk about our commission, we have to keep this in mind. It's not just about launching or being launched from a platform. Uh, and, and we have to realize that it's not the pastor's job, it's not the senior pastor's job to uh, provide us uh, with the church as a launching pad to, to, to launch our own agendas. The agenda is the mission that Christ gave us, that we ought to be his witnesses, that we ought to to go ye therefore into all the world and teach all nations. But in order for us to be teachers of the word, we've got to first become students of the word. We don't graduate from Bible class. We don't graduate from Sunday school. We don't graduate from being mentored by the leaders that God has placed over us. And if the pastor has set leaders in position. It's because they are trusted. It's because they've been tried. It's because they've been proven. It's because they have the ability to submit and subject themselves to leadership. And if we as the congregation cannot acknowledge that and accept that and, 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 and work with that, then we need to check ourselves. Because if we cannot respect the leaders that the pastor, the senior pastor has put in place, then we have an issue with the pastor. Because, you know, you get these people that say things like, well, I'm not going, I'm going to wait till I hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Well, if he has delegated those responsibilities to leaders who are under him, you've heard it from the horse's mouth. And so what I'm saying here, I want you to go back to this book of Acts in Acts chapter two, when we talk about the early church, look at the signs of the early church. They were, first of all, glad they received the gospel. Somebody had to preach it. Somebody had to teach it. Somebody had to put it out there. How did they put it out there? They went to various places to preach. They went to places to disseminate, to propagate, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, there's so many methods that can be used. I wanted to talk about one uh, in particular, and I'll, maybe I'll get to that before this is over. It's something that's going to absolutely just blow your mind. But witnessing, and this is what the saints of God have to understand, sheep beget sheep. It's not just the leader's job 
to beget sheep, okay, or to go after the sheep, or when the sheep come into the house, the pastor, whoever's preaching, is preaching, and it's evangelistic. No, every single one of us have been given a commission, a commission. It's for all of us. That's what we read about in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, the Lord said. You're going to begin in Jerusalem, in Judea, and even unto the uttermost parts of the earth, Kansas City, Missouri, in the grocery store, at the cleaners, in your school system, at on your jobs, wherever you are, you are a witness. How do you become a witness? You open up your mouth. You share the gospel. How do you share the gospel? Let me say this. You don't have to know the entire Bible to share the gospel. Your testimony, your testimony is powerful. Your testimony cannot be refuted. Tell people what you used to be and who you are now. Tell people what God has brought you out of, and people relate to your testimony. Once they hear your testimony, I'm going to tell you something. Bam. You just bring it in there and hit them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who saved me. He's the one who took my sins away, my bad habits, my ugly attitude, my dope smoking, whatever it was you were involved in. The Bible says, and such were some of you. Oh, but now you are washed. Come on here. You're sanctified by the power that you receive from Jesus Christ. And that's what you share with people. And let me tell you something, you're already empowered. I love what Bishop Brady is doing because what he is doing through these impact classes is he is empowering you. You are being empowered. As you listen, you're being empowered. You don't need a license to tell somebody that Jesus saved. You don't need to be ordained. You don't need credentials from the organization. Let me tell you something. You've got people right in your house. You've got people right in your family. You've got people right in your neighborhood, your next door neighbor, the person you meet in the store, the people who work on your job. They're watching you. Your life is that first witness. Do not underestimate that. Your life is a witness for the Lord. If you look in this Acts chapter 2, in this um, second chapter, look at what they did in verse 42. Not only did they continue, they continued to be taught the word of God. But look at this. They continued in fellowship. Fellowship is so important. Important. Do you know fellowship means that we are fellows in the same ship, that we have, we're a body of people, we have something in common, and we strengthen one another, and we can share the gospel with one another. So our, so our mission is an important task. It's been assigned to us. It is our business, and this is what I tell the saints here at home. Listen, let me say this to you. Your job I know it's how you pay your bills. I know it's your lifeline. But guess what? The gospel is your first job. That job helps you to fund the gospel. This is your real job. What you do for the Lord is your real job. What you do for the church, for the kingdom, that's your real job. So everywhere you go, you should be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our first mission, and they continue. So fellowship has to do with, with coming together, sharing, com being in communion with one another. And that is so powerful if we really understand what the mission is about. Now, I, I, wanna, I, I want to, in the time that I have left, I got to share this with you because this is so, so powerful. This takes us into the second part of that Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And it's something that we don't ordinarily think about. We think about knocking on doors, and we should have teams that go out, maybe even weekly to knock on doors. But if you're not knocking on doors, you should be sharing the gospel with your family, your friends, your co-workers. You should be giving testimonies. You should be inviting people to church, okay? Sharing your faith, what you believe, why you believe it, okay? But let me give you a powerful, powerful, method that 
many people in the kingdom of God do not think about. And the Lord shared this with me some time ago, and it's called biblical hospitality. It's something that we have to exercise in our church, in our churches, but it's something that every member of the body of Christ can partake of. Okay. Hebrews 13 verses one through two say, says, let brotherly love continue. And then it says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Let me just give you some examples of ways that you can share your faith. Okay. A lot of times people don't think about they, somebody in your neighborhood dies. You may not know them. You go to that house. You get in touch with those people. That is a huge opportunity. When people are grieving, you say, well, I don't want to mess with them while they're grieving. Baby, that is the time. They are open. They are more susceptible. They are more uh, receptive of the gospel of Jesus Christ at that time. So that is the time. Take them a fruit basket. Take them a cake from the store. When somebody new moves into your neighborhood, show love, hospitality. Go welcome them to the neighborhood. You build relationships like that. And so when I talk about this, be not uh, forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. If you look at our world today and all of the un kind things that people do against other people. They insult them, they're hate crimes, there's violence. It makes people, including the saints, not want to deal with anybody that you don't know. You barely want to deal with the people that you do know because people just don't care a lot about how other people feel. So when you come with this power, the love, the hospitality, the spirit of fellowship, even to strangers, you're going to surprise people. You're going to uh, be such an example because they're not expecting people to be kind. They're not expecting people to be hospitable to them. So in it, because we live in a world where it seems like the nastier and the meaner you are, you're celebrated in our culture. That's why some of these um, internet programs and television programs and series are so popular because they showcase our nastiness as a culture and our meanness as a culture. People love to see a fight. We love to be at odds with each other, and we will pay to see other people at odds with each other. In American culture, that's entertainment. It's on Facebook. It's on Twitter. It's on YouTube. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's a part of the culture, you name it, that people will post a fight before they post a church service or something positive. And so I want to say that because it is so, so, so important that we learn how to be hospitable. That is number one of the number one ways to share the gospel to, with people that you don't know. So even when we're being positive or we're doing something good, it just seems like it's for social media likes in our culture. So much is done in order to get something in return. But Jesus told us in the New Testament when he gave that parable, he said, listen, he said, when you make a dinner, don't get those who can pay you back and invite you back. But he said, go into the highways and the hedges, bring the blind, the maimed, the crippled, bring those who are poor, those who cannot invite you back, those who can't uh, do anything for you and watch how the Lord blesses you. Oh my God, I want you to know, and we live in such a dog eat dog world, even on Twitter, which is now X, everything is about politics. It's about the Republicans against the Democrats and all of this hatred that's going on uh, in po the political world. We're always at odds. So we tend to keep our distance from one another. We don't know our neighbors. We live next door to people. We don't know them. We don't speak. We don't interact. Everybody is a stranger and we like it like that. So we don't really want to do what it takes to be close to other people. But I'm giving you today 
uh, strategy because I could sit here all day and talk about what we need to do. But I want to give you this important strategy for how to do it. And I want you to know that it works. And you have to know, you know, I look at some of you all's Facebook status and it talks about your relationship status. You got up there. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. It is complicated, isn't it? It's complicated because loving others it's complicated. It's risky business. Being kind to other people means that I risk taking, being taken advantage of. All right. And so everybody is guarded. We're guarded about how we allow people to get close to us. And I want to say this because we think that we have to have a fancy house with beautiful furniture and gorgeous flo uh, floors and awesome uh, curtains and paint job and uh, walls nice. We think we have to do that before we invite somebody into our home. Let me give you a news flash because we want to say, listen, my house is not as fine as yours. We're always in some kind of competition with each other. But let me tell you something. I want you today to reevaluate how you relate to people. And, com and how we compare how we relate to people with what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us to honor one another. It teaches us to esteem one another better than ourselves. It teaches us to use hospitality, the Bible says, without complaining, to show love to one another and cause people to feel the love of God. All of you can do that. It doesn't matter how introverted you are, because you don't have to stand up in front of people and preach a message. You don't have to be able to operate a PowerPoint. It's just speaking to people when they come to your church. It's just being kind to people. It's just when somebody, when a visitor comes in, instead of the, if they ask you, where's the restroom? Oh, it's down the hall, down there. Uh, you say, come here, I'll show you. It's, it's inviting people into your home and showing hospitality to them. It's about taking something to your neighbors. Uh, you're, that's how we spread the gospel. But we don't think of it in those terms. We think, oh, I got to preach. I got I to gotta be a great Bible teacher. I got I to gotta be able to explain the scriptures. I got to be able to teach a Bible study. And stuff. Those are all good, and we should do those things. But I want to talk to the common person because in the lesson that you presented to me, the writer was saying that in the book that you're studying, that this is for everybody. So I'm giving you principles and strategies of how everybody can reach somebody. Some of you would never stand behind a pulpit and preach a message, but you have the gift of hospitality. You're kind. Your smile is beautiful. You know how to treat people. You know how to love people. You know how to make people feel welcome. And, and it's not rocket science because you know how you like to be treated. You know when you go in a place and people are rude. You know when you're being ignored. You don't do that to somebody else. So this is so, so powerful, okay? Um, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 through 34, that when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them, but love them as yourself. For you used to be foreigners in Egypt. He says, I am the Lord, your God. Romans chapter 12, verse 13 says, distributing to the necessity of the saints. We got to be kind to one another as well. That's how we make disciples. Don't assume that everybody in your church is discipled. No, they, you, and I told the, 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 even the young women, probably in their 30s and 40s in our church, I said, you know what? If you've been here any length of time, the Bible says the older women should teach the younger women. You got you to gotta help train others. You got to help teach others. You got to help spread the gospel and disciple others. People are always being discipled. It doesn't matter how long they've been in church. You, you never stop learning. You never stop growing your relationship with God. So how do you do that? When you learn, you teach. And as you teach, you learn. So you share what you know. That's what Titus was saying when he said the older women teach the younger women and the older men be an example. You're always discipling somebody. You're sharing who Christ is. And as you strengthen them, they can go out and strengthen others. So, so Elisha 
uh, I'm sorry, Romans said, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given, I want you to underscore that, given to hospitality. It's, it's who you are. It's when people come in your church, you make them feel welcome. It's when you go in the grocery store, you're kind. It's when you when you are on your job, you are you, you you're doing nice things for people, or you're at least lending lending in, in, in a listening ear, uh, ear rather, and you're making people feel comfortable in your presence. Why? You got the Holy Ghost, baby. They're drawn to you. They don't even know why they're drawn to you. They're just drawn to you because you're given to hospitality. What does that mean? It means that when I'm in the company of somebody else, I'm not on my cell phone. It means when I'm in the company of somebody else, I'm focused on them. I'm paying attention to them. I'm asking how they're doing and about their day. That's hospitality. I'm, I'm telling you how to win these souls, how to win souls, because people are watching more of what you do than what you say. So you have an opportunity one-on-one. -on -one. I got to move through here because my time is almost up. So hospitality is the care of people. It's the care of guests. It's the care of visitors. It's the care of strangers. It is the friendly and generous reception of guests. Friendliness, being generous, being kind-hearted, being cordial, being liberal, being helpful. It's not merely entertaining them. And that's the reason why some of you don't invite people to your home. Oh, I don't want to entertain. No, it's not about entertaining. When Jesus went to the home of Mary and Martha, uh, that was Martha who was so cumbered about because she was an entertainer. This has got to be perfect. That's got to be perfect. The meal's got to be right. The house has got to be perfect. But Mary just gave him her undivided attention. That's hospitality. And Jesus said, when Martha came to him and said, tell my sister to come and help me. Uh, I got all this to do. He said, oh, Martha, you're cumbered about with so many things. You got this. And we do the same thing in the church. We're just so big. I got to get this job done. I got to get this job that we don't have time to speak to people, to be kind to people, to welcome the guests in. We want them to just get welcomed officially at the podium. We want all the guests to please stand. And we want, but you just passed them by and you didn't speak. You just passed them by and you didn't smile. You cut them off on the highway when they were trying to get to the store. You were in the store and they saw you being mean and ugly and nasty. No, you represent Christ everywhere you go. You're given glory to God, to hospitality. That's how we win souls. You have to remember when you go through the drive-thru, you, you're not just the impatient blowing your horn, two, 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 two. I, I, I ordered this, this a uh, Big Mac, 15 minutes. No, because that's a potential member of your church. That's a potential person for the kingdom of God. So how you behave and conduct yourself absolutely matters. You say, well, I can't always be perfect. No, nobody's asking you to be perfect. We're just asking you to be kind. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in his word. And it will settle your spirit. It will calm your nerves. It will cause you not to be anxious. The Bible says be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the God of peace, what is he going to do? He's going to keep your mind. Uh-huh. He's going to keep your heart. You ain't going to have no heart attack. You're not going to lose your mind. He's going to keep you, honey. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me, let me just say this. This is, this is a strategy that the Lord gave me. And we have to understand that hospitality is very important. Entertain, to entertain is good. Some of you are expert entertainers. You can cook. Oh, my God. You can cook. Some, some, some of y'all can't cook, but you think you can cook. So that's the reason why you can order your chicken from Golden Corral or Snooks or whatever grocery store you got up there. You don't have to. And I, one of the ladies in my church some years ago when we first came to Alton, my husband and I, um, she would invite us over for dinner. We would go. And she was a good cook, but she didn't spend all day slaving over a stove. She ordered some fried chicken from somewhere. She might have made some, you know, rice or mashed potatoes or something to go with it, some green beans. So you don't have to be perfect to entertain people. But let me just say this to you, inviting people to your home. Who do you invite? What about your neighbors? What about 
the person next door. People will come to visit you at home before they will come to your church. They'll, you, you say, listen, just, I read about a lady who was trying to win her neighborhood to the Lord. You know what she did? She just had a dinner party at her house, at her house, and she invited everybody on her block. She was shocked because they showed up. They actually came. She had been inviting the people to church since no, not when, but when she invited them to her house for dinner, and you know what? They felt so comfortable. She shared the gospel. Then she gave them an invitation to come to church, and people came. And that's how this lady got saved that, sh that I got this story from, because somebody, she was, she was an atheist. She was uh, formerly a lesbian, actually, and God allowed a pastor to reach out to her and invite her to his home, and she kept coming, and she saw how they lived and how their their faith was just exemplified through their family, and the lady ended up giving her life to the Lord. I'm saying to you, hospitality means something, and to entertain is good. It can be included in what you do, but when you are hospitable, it's not merely to entertain is not merely to enthrall or to fascinate people or hold the attention of your guests. The motive is different than that of hospitality. When you just want to entertain, you're concerned about whether you have the best looking furniture or the newest linen or the nicest house on the block or whatever before you invite people over for dinner. But with hospitality, is not so much about trying to impress others with our things. It's caring for others with what we have, with what we have. When the Good Samaritan found that wounded traveler on the Jericho Road, what did he do? He didn't pass him by. He picked him up. He bandaged his wounds. He put him on his donkey. He took him to the inn, and he paid for his stay. That was hospitality. Hospitality is genuinely taking care of of a stranger. And you have to understand that in the Bible days, hospitality was crucial. It could mean the difference between life and death because travel was treacherous. And as we see with the man on the Jericho Road, he was robbed, he was beaten almost to death, and he was left there. But when you were welcomed into somebody's home, it was insurance against those kinds of mishaps on the road. They would be hungry, they'd be tired, they'd be worn from travel, and it didn't matter if they were strangers. You would take them in, you would care for them, and you would protect them, and you would refuse to just abandon them. I know that sounds far-fetched in this cruel day in which we live, but there are people that you're trying to win to the Lord. Yes, do the knocking on doors. Yes, do the follow-up from your church and share the gospel. Yes, get your visitors' cards and have someone or team go back through the visitors' cards weekly and make phone calls to those people who came to visit and let them know we enjoyed having you there. Yes, have a text service to where your visitors will get these text messages saying we enjoyed having you in our service. Do all of that. Do the knocking on of doors. Do all of that. But most importantly, do not forget and leave out hospitality. When people come to your church, get a team together. When it, if it's raining, get some umbrellas and go meet them. That's going to blow their mind as they get out of their car and walk them to the door. Take a personal interest in people, and that's going to help you share your faith and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So you could preach Jesus all day long and people are going to receive the gospel. They're going to hear it. But what about those people who are right in your pathway, right in your family, right in your neighborhood, right in your cubicle next door? If you're just inviting them to church and you have not been able to get them to come, try taking a personal interest in them and use hospitality without complaining. I have an aunt. She married into my mother's family. Her name is Marion. And 
when my uncle was alive and they were younger, they would, it didn't matter what time of day or night you went to their house, knocked on the door. They received you. She started getting food and stuff out to cook and all of that kind of stuff. You know, I know that we're living in a different day and time, but I do want to tell us that biblical hospitality is what wins souls. And I'll tell you something else. It opens the door for your miracle. You're going to see people respond to you that never responded before simply because you gave them an invitation. Take them to lunch. Take them to dinner. Be kind to people. That's going to win souls more than all the doors you could knock on, more than you could get at a tent revival. Start, and it's something that every member of your church can be engaged in. Some people say, well, they might be too old. I can't, I can't knock on door. My, my doors, my legs won't allow me. Uh, my health won't allow me. Or, who I'm just, you know, I'm too shy. But you're not too shy to be kind, to be hospitable. That's how you share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you in some way. Uh, because it has blessed me is what, and I needed to be reminded of this. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to have been able to share this with you today. And again, I certainly want to give the utmost honor to Bishop Aglin Brady and to First Lady Gray, uh, Brady and to all of the pastors on staff at this great church. And I praise God for you. I bless the Lord for you and I honor you today. And thank you for giving me this opportunity, Bethel, to speak to you today on the subject of uh, your mission and sharing the gospel. And let the mission of Jesus Christ be everybody's mission. Let me close with this. What I'm saying to you today about hospitality, I want you to think about in the same way that you read about Jesus in the scriptures. He took the time with one individual, the woman at the well. Remember that? He took the time to, to heal individuals. He wasn't just about being up at front, being up in the front, being behind a podium, you know, having to, um, you know, preach to the masses. He, the masses were drawn to him, but it was because of his individual care and kindness to people on an individual level. May God bless